I show you. I'm king. I'm king. My name is Onita. When people think of FMW, the wild death matches immediately come to mind and for good reason. The promotion was the innovator in what we know as the deathmatch style. There were so many things that were given to the wrestling world from the company, and no matter how you feel about him, it all happened because of one man, Atsushi Onita. He would begin his wrestling journey by trying to get into the All Japan Dojo. Giant Baba broke his usual rule and allowed Onita to join the dojo even though he had not graduated high school. Even though they gave an exemption to Onita, he was never given a real push in the company. He was sent to the Dominican Republic where Onita would get into an exchange with wrestlers for not wanting to lose two straight falls in a two out of three falls bout. Onita was left badly beaten after this, but was helped out by Terry Funk. Funk would bring him back to his ranch in Texas and then get Onita booked in Memphis wrestling. Funk helping out. Onita at this time began a friendship that would lead to one of the biggest moments in Onita's life down the line, and no doubt he was inspired by the Memphis wrestling style. In 1982, he found himself heading back to Japan where Onita was a junior heavyweight standout in All Japan's new junior division. At the time, Tiger Mask had blown up and the junior heavyweights had seen a massive resurgence. He would begin a feud here with Chavo Guerrero, where they would exchange the championship over multiple continents and promotions with the most famous bout being a tournament final where Onita would win and go to shake hands with Chavo. Chavo would turn on Onita and destroy the trophy on Onita in what would result in the first of many times Onita would bleed in Japan. The division never caught fire quite like the new Japan division, but it was still a very memorable run. By the time 1985 had come around, Onita would have a terrible accident where he fell from the ring by slipping to the ground. This would damage his knee terribly and would result him not being able to wrestle. He would try to push through, but Baba would pull him aside and let him know that he had to let him go. Baba would give Onita a retirement ceremony and even some payment to keep him on his feet as he tried to find his way back into a normal life. Onita was never comfortable during this time. He tried to work normal jobs and found himself in construction and was even ahead of his time in another way as he was selling cell phones in the 80s, but he would take a nasty fall while working construction and was again out of work. During this time, he would get in trouble with the law and tried many things to make ends meet to get by after he was forced into retirement. Onita just couldn't adjust or accept that his career had ended by the hand of an accident and right when he seemed to be on the brink of his big break. However, this was a different world than today's wrestling landscape. When you were out of New Japan or All Japan, that was pretty much the end for you. There were only those two places to earn a living for a wrestler in Japan, and once you were retired from one of those, you were done. But Onida had other plans. He would make his first return from retirement at a Joshi promotion called Pioneer Senshei, and it was not received well by the audience. It wasn't anything to do with Onita specifically, but the fans simply didn't want to see male wrestlers. Even with the poor reception, there was one thing that Onita knew now. He knew that he could still work a wrestling match if he put limitations on himself. Onita would begin to show up to the UWF shows and try to start some kind of angle with the company. He had done this without the company's knowledge and they would tell him he was not allowed in the building. Onita challenging the shoot style promotion and them refusing to accept actually would work in his favor. He knew that his knees were not going to be able to do a lot of high flying, but he figured he would be able to work shoot matches. This would lead to Onita seeking someone with legitimacy to have a bout with. To fit this bill, he would have his sights set on karate legend, Masashi Oyagi. He was the top star with the World Karate Association. 
he would promote a match between himself and Oyagi, and it began with a martial arts rules match that Onita would be disqualified in after tossing the referee from the ring, resulting in a huge brawl between both sides. After the bout, he would challenge Oyagi to a match that would mix the rules of pro wrestling and martial arts. This would lead to the beginning of frontier martial arts wrestling, as it was meant simply to be a banner to promote these mixed style matches Onita was planning to do with the karate fighter. The first show was in Oyagi's hometown, where Oyagi would get the victory. The second show would have them in the world famous Koroken Hall, and Onita would get the victory with a fire thunder powerbomb. With this, the plan for FMW was finished. This was all it was ever meant to be, but the shows were so successful that they felt it just had to keep going. The fans were more behind him than ever, and he was becoming a big name in wrestling just by doing these two matches. With some talking to sponsors and the World Karate Association, Onita had already got this far, why stop now? When forming FMW shows, he had found a man who had a similar situation of being let go by All Japan and Tarzan Goto. He would bring him in as well as a former sumo wrestler turned Puerto Rican deathmatch guru, Mr. Pogo. Onita was trying to get a hold of a group of monster heels and he had hit gold with those two. He assumed that if he was going to keep the show going, he would need a similar heel factory form of booking, similar to Jerry Lawler in Memphis. FMW would have its own dojo open and begin to form a roster. Onita would bring in many legends to help the company's perception to be that of a company that was there to stay. They also were willing to do the brawling style that he was doing. The first FMW tour was a success and would see him continue the feud with karate fighters and one of the fighters would be the future Mr. Danger, Mitsuhiro Matsunaga. These matches would keep gaining momentum for the company and they were seeing genuine growth in the company. The end of the tour would be the first barbed wire death match. The bout was far different in presentation from what would become the norm, mainly being that they used the sharpest barbed wire. And you could really tell. Onita would go on to wear the scars of this match for the rest of his career. Onita would also set his promotion apart from the other two big offerings in Japanese wrestling by having a women's division. From pretty much the beginning, Onita had women's wrestling as a part of his shows, and it would lead to Megumi Kudo, Combat Toyota, and others becoming big stars at the time. Onita would defeat Journeyman Beast the Barbarian to claim what would become the company's top championship, the Brass Knuckles heavyweight title. Onita would have his first big defense set up against Tarzan Goto, and it would be the first exploding barbed wire match. Seeing the genesis of what would become a staple of FMW now is quite something. Onita had found a niche in the market, and with his injuries and limitations, he would be able to put on matches that could rival the excitement of the biggest wrestling companies by simply using special effects to enhance his performance. The practice was common in movies and music, and Onita knew that he could use the same philosophy with wrestling. The bout was held in a venue that resembled an airplane hangar and was able to accommodate their largest crowd to date. The match was different than anything anyone had seen and was put on the covers of all the magazines as well as go on to win Match of the Year Award across the board in many of the same publications. Tarzan Goto and Onita would forever be linked because of the bout, and many see Tarzan Goto as an unsung hero of the company, and over time he would hold resentment about time there due to believing he would never be seen as anything more than second best to Onita. In addition to the martial arts rivals, Onita also had a relationship with the Puerto Rican wrestling scene and was able to bring in many legends from that region as well. Onita's relentless promoting had not done him wrong yet, but using his connections to Puerto Rico, he would make his first real misstep. He would set up an angle in Puerto Rico where he was attacked by Invader One. If you are unaware, Invader is the man who murdered Bruiser Brody. 
The angle was filmed and it consisted of Invader legitimately stabbing Onita. Um, you know, you, I, I thought maybe uh, the mafia or the Puerto Rican mob was going to come after me and kill me. So I was always looking over my back and it upset me. But uh, it, not, nothing ever became of it. The match never took place because the fans, the um, press was so against, uh, against the idea. And uh, that whole thing really kind of went down the toilet. But uh, I've got some pictures that have never been seen before of the stabbing angle. And I'd like to share them with you and the fans out there. So um, this is the beginning of the stabbing angle. And that's Jose gouging out Onita's eyes. Um, here's another one. And that's uh, in the back is Victor Quiones, and he was part owner. And he was um, he was actually behind it as well, but um, um, Gonzalez didn't know that. Um, here's one of Onita laying on the ground with the blood that's on the floor that we scooped up. And here's um, another one, now the trash can's turned over. And here's the um, ambulance taking um, Onita to the hospital. Onita would be filmed getting himself treated in a hospital and would vow revenge on Invader. It's hard to explain just how much this was one of the most shocking things anyone has probably ever seen in wrestling. And even worse, this was not something that helped the promotion. The entire thing caused a huge amount of backlash. As good as he is at promotion, one of Onita's biggest problems would be that he would do such a great job walking the line, but in the instances he would go over the line, he would truly overstep. This entire angle was hated by almost everyone who had seen it. Onita would kick off a feud in 1990 with Mr. Pogo and these two would become the main feud that a lot of people remember from early FMW shows. During the Onita era, the company would become known for these matches slowly more than the martial arts centric bouts that were originally intended. The two would have the first exploding barbed wire landmine match. The two would have a wild brawl that would set a new high for the promotion and show that they were willing to pull off much more grand spectacles in their bouts than other promotions. They may not be able to have matches that would have the technical mastery of other promotions, but what they did bring to the table was something you weren't going to see anywhere else at the time. Around this time, some of his business partners would leave the company. Mickey Ibaragi would begin the wing promotion that would become the direct competition to FMW. This would not see many of the wrestlers leave, but it did see Mr. Pogo depart for the new promotion. Even with this, FMW remained on an upward trajectory and Onita's popularity was only rising. FMW had become so big of a deal they were set to hold a huge Kawasaki Stadium show. This was a massive risk for the promotion. As if they had not sold enough seats, they would have been very much in debt. For Onita and FMW, this was a situation where failure was not an option. If they were going to do it, they had to make it count. Tarzan Goto, who had the boat with Onita a year before, was called on again to have a match, but this time in an exploding cage. The audience loved it and the show was a huge success. FMW was on a roll that just couldn't be stopped and Onita's popularity was just not slowing down anytime soon. Onita would bring in the Sheik and Sabu around this time. Two men who would become heavily associated with the promotion. Onita would set up a feud that would become very famous for just how insane it was. On May 6, 1992, this match would become famous for the fire getting so out of control they had to abandon the ring and the logo on the mat beginning to boil on the canvas. Well, the fire match, I didn't want to do it. They, they didn't ask me, they told me how to do it. They didn't say, hey, do you want to do a fire match? They didn't ask me. They told me, and they told me the morning of the show. They didn't tell me in advance, there wasn't even no advertisement for it. I, I, really, didn't, I really didn't want to do it, but I did it. Uh -oh. Yeah, I was the first one to jump out.
The match was a disaster, but was such a wild sight, it became another positive for marketing as it showed what the men were willing to have happen in matches. Onita would once more dabble with the shoot style by having Leon Spinks win the championship and attempt to run a big show with the former heavyweight boxing champion of the world and himself in a steel cage. This match would be the first big miss at the box office. Fans just weren't as interested in the mixed styles matches as they were in the new death matches that Onita had began to popularize. He would be quick to go back to what worked by kicking off a feud with Tiger Jeet Singh that would lead to Onita putting his own spin on the island death match. New Japan had done a few of them, but Onita would go to the same location and add his signature exploding barbed wire to the mix and set up a big bout with Singh at Yokohama Stadium. 30,000 people would attend to see him regain the championship against Singh. And with that, another successful stadium show under his belt. Onita would continue to promote his deathmatch style and seemed invincible to many people, but was quickly reminded of his mortality after an incident in late 1992. Onita had a deathmatch and would celebrate outside the arena in Osaka, and during his celebration he would jump into the river. With all the cuts on his body, he became violently ill from the germs in the river getting into his open wounds. He would make his way back, but soon after would be in another accident that he could have lost his life as a result of. Onita had accidentally swallowed some barbed wire during one of his matches and was unable to breathe. With the help of medical intervention, he would make a full recovery. During this time, FMW would see a downturn in attendance further showing Onita that if he was not around, then FMW wasn't really going to be able to survive. He would come back to the promotion and begin negotiating for what would be one of the biggest matches in the company's history. Terry Funk at Kawasaki Stadium would be huge. To make it even bigger, Onita would make this the first ever exploding ring match. Onita was able to pin Funk shortly before the bomb went off he was walking away when he realized that Terry Funk was not moving in the ring. Onita would run back to the ring and give a great performance of trying to wake up the legend and eventually covering Funk with his own body. But if you look at a, Onita's card, it was one match, it was ultraviolet, maybe two matches. But uh, the reason that was done because he had to capture the media. And the media over there was not television. I mean, the other organizations had TV. Now here's a guy that had no TV, so what's he gonna do? He's gotta get into the periodical some way. So what's gonna be better is uh, uh, Hulk Hogan jumping up in the air and landing on somebody's throat with the back of his leg here, or seeing some guy stick a two by four up another guy's ass which is gonna go in the paper and get the most comments. The guy sticking the two by four up a guy's ass, I think. I might be wrong on that, but it wouldn't be very pretty, but it'd damn sure make people talk, wouldn't it? So that's how he did it. Up to the point of drawing 42,000 people with me and him in a, in a barbed wire match over there. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable, paying several million dollars and uh, and I really appreciated him giving me that $5,000 for that match. He was bigger than ever now. Around 40,000 people would attend the bout and see the spectacle, and the path to legendary status was now well underway. Onita would soon reach out to his old rival, Mr. Pogo, and was able to get Mr. Pogo to return to FMW. This would be a pretty strong blow to wing, and they would not be long for the world. Mr. Pogo is instantly into the main event scene with Onita again, and they easily restart their rivalry from years before. 
they would bring in 12,000 to the stadium in Kyushu to see the two start up a new chapter in their rivalry. Pogo would give a dominant performance, and after a post-match attack on Onida, we would see one of the first real interactions between Onida and Hayabusa, as it was Hayabusa who would run to the ring. 32,000 people would show up to see Onida and Mr. Pogo in their rematch. This bout would be an explosive cage death match and would be a huge success for the promotion. But it was nothing compared to what came next. Onida would soon join up with the war promotion, where he pinned Tenru in a tag team match which was beyond significant and set up a bout with the former Triple Crown champion. The May 5th show at Kawasaki Stadium is where Tenru would face off with Onida in a match that drew over 50,000 people. Tenru would get his win back over Onida and he would announce his retirement after the show, leading to a one-year retirement tour that would end with a final stop back at Kawasaki Stadium a year later. In Onida's mind, this would be a fine place to end the company. He was being featured in movies and had other goals he wanted to achieve, so he wished to step away and do that. He didn't see FMW being able to continue without him, and to him this wasn't a big deal. It was always just a vehicle for him to promote his matches outside of the big promotions, and it had served that purpose. A standout bout from the retirement tour was the exploding landmine death match held in an Olympic swimming pool. The match will always stand out for its atmosphere and the spectacle of the explosions in the water, making it just one more of the amazing moments Onida was able to create during this legendary run. Onida would exchange the championship with Mr. Pogo during this time. With the wing promotion folding, the retirement year of Onida had a lot to do with a feud against a faction of wing wrestlers. This feud would be a strong one heading into the retirement of Onita and was able to carry the company into this last big run. Onita would hold a press conference in early 1995 to let everyone know that he would be walking away but that it had been purchased by his friend Shoichi Arai and would continue even with him gone. Onita had always seen the promotion ending when he retired, but was talked out of that by his stepfather who would tell him it was better to sell it to someone so that the wrestlers would be able to keep their jobs in security. Reflecting on all that he had built, Onita would agree and go through with the sale of the company. During this time, Tarzan Goto would be turned heel once again in what looked like a way to set up he and Onita in another Kawasaki match. It is even announced and it is said that they would have the biggest bombs ever in this bout. A few days later, Tarzan Goto would take Mr. Ganesuke along with Flying Kid Ichihara and leave FMW. It has never been said as to why this took place, but there are a few reasons that have been stated. One reason was that none of the wrestlers were very big fans of Tarzan, and with Onita on the way out, things could become hostile in the work environment. Another reason that Onita himself feels is the reason that he asked Goto to portray a member of a terrorist cult that had committed a very real attack on Japanese subways at the time for their feud. This request would infuriate Tarzan Goto, and it is said that the two would not speak for several years after this. Most feel this is the reason he likely left, along with knowing he would be losing at yet another Kawasaki main event if he did stay. This would begin what would become a very tumultuous time with the company. Onita is in dire need of an opponent and is under a month away from the bout. The obvious choice would be to go with Mr. Pogo, but he was offended at being second choice and declined the bout. Onita was now scrambling to find a suitable opponent for this stadium show. Less than 10 days were left, and he still didn't have an opponent. Takashi Ishikawa would be pulled in for the date. He was a former All Japan wrestler who had joined Tenru when he left to create his wrestling promotions in the 90s. At the time, he was working with Tokyo Pro and was quick to accept the role. On April the 30th, Ishikawa and Onita put on a press conference to announce the bout. 
but in the midst of it, Hayabusa would make an appearance. He would come up to the men and get on his knees, begging to have the bout with Onida. Hayabusa had become the man the company wanted to run with after Onida retired. He had shown he was able to put on excellent matches, but had yet to reach a match where he was able to be cast in the role of a top performer. This match could really do wonders for him if he would be able to convince Onida to face him. Onida would get into Hayabusa's face yelling at him for interrupting the press conference and shouting him down for not even knowing what it was like to be on Onida's level. Hayabusa was never one of his favorite people and there could even be said to be some professional resentment between the two, staring down his literal replacement in his company that he didn't even want to continue without him. To him, FMW was Onita and he had built that on his own out of nothing. Ishikawa would stand and give the bout to Hayabusa, saying that his words had moved him and that the young man deserved the opportunity. Having his retirement ceremony turn into a torch-passing type event was something Onita maybe never forgave. He always saw himself facing a huge star for this show. However, when the time came and the field of possible bouts were all laid out, the best choice that could be made was the dojo boy he didn't even like. When the two men would face off, many consider it to be one of the better explosion matches. Onita would get the victory and retire from wrestling, leaving his promotion and the wrestlers in it behind. Onita would go back into the normal world to live a typical life again. He was aiming to continue his acting career and move into a much calmer way of earning his living. He had become such a huge star during his time as the deathmatch innovator and was one of the most popular wrestlers around at the time. The FMW promotion had garnered some debts before Onita had left as he never meant for it to continue after his retirement. Now that the company had been sold to keep it going in a post Onita world, it was assumed that with some smart booking and the existing deals that the company would be able to take care of the debts pretty easily. This was not the case, and the company would be told by many of the existing partners that they were no longer interested in the company without Onita, and many of their distribution deals would walk out shortly after. FMW was just not able to ascend back to the popularity it had during the previous Onita years. Onita would see moderate success in his acting endeavors. He had expected to be one of the biggest stars in the acting world from the jump, but that just didn't work the way he had planned. The fame he had gained in pro wrestling simply had not translated to him being a top actor, but aside from one time attending a show to watch, he would not return to FMW for even guest roles. He did, however, keep in contact with President Shoichi Arai, and the two would confide in each other about the struggles they were facing at the time. For Arai, big troubles were about to begin. Hayabusa had been hurt badly on the tours and would require surgery that would keep him out for several months leading into the annual Kawasaki show. Hayabusa had injured everything from his eye to his knees, including a ruptured tricep and just couldn't continue. Doctors recommended he take a year off, and he elected to take four months off instead so he could make it to the stadium show. Onita would speak to magazines and take aim at Hayabusa being injured. Onita knowing that the March 1996 show was a huge show for FMW would criticize him for not making such a big event, expressing a sentiment we still see now about how the younger generation just wasn't comparable to his would stoke the flames that he would be returning. And it seemed only a matter of time before we would see Onita in a wrestling ring once again. The March FMW show would see Onita make his first appearance in a ring since his retirement. It had been announced that he would be on the show and it would draw the largest attendance since he had left the company to the Sapporo gym. Onita was still a huge draw for the company and he was still what many saw as the heart and soul. As the time for the big Kawasaki show grew closer, FMW would now bring in Mr. Pogo and Terry Funk to somewhat make a turnaround on the new FMW styles that had centered on ring work. Arai had been discussing business with Onita 
And though Onita was no longer in any power with the company, he would be someone the president would listen to on making business decisions, and it would lead to the president going back and forth on what he wanted the style of the company to be. When the Kawasaki Stadium show came around, the company would put on one of the best cards they had ever done. Even during the Onita era, it can be said that the first Kawasaki show without an Onita match could be one of the best shows. The card would have another retirement match, this time with Combat Toyota facing Megumi Kudo in an exploding barbed wire death match. The match is a classic and one of the best women's wrestling bouts of all time. At the conclusion, Onita would make his way to the ring in his theater of throwing water on them and would carry Toyota on his shoulders to the back. As emotional as this match was, the main event would be what left many people wondering about the direction of the company. Mr. Pogo and Terry Funk would face Masato Tanaka and Hayabusa in an exploding ring death match. The match was as wild as could be expected, and even though the company had been getting behind the younger talent, this match would be won by Terry Funk and Mr. Pogo. At the end of the bout, Funk would get on the microphone and call out Onita, saying that Onita feared him and was just sending the FMW young boys because he was too afraid to face him. This was obviously not a ringing endorsement of the company's new top star from Terry Funk, and it was followed by seeing Hayabusa backstage crying and being shouted at by Atsushi Onita. It had only been a year, but it already seemed that Hayabusa and his time at the top were in question with the company. This would put a genuine resentment between the two toward each other. Hayabusa would resent Onita never fully endorsing him or allowing him to grow his own legend. While the two men were contemporaries, they simply did not and could not get along with each other. One saw the other as the man holding them back, and the other saw nothing but a young upstart who thinks he can replace him. Their positions and goals were never going to allow them to be friendly. Onita would let President Arai know that he was going to come back, and Arai would immediately try to turn down the offer because they had spent a year promoting his retirement. Onita had planned it that he would come back because Mr. Pogo would ask him to come back and be his partner in a retirement match. Funny thing was that Pogo had no idea of this and had no intention of retiring. Onita told Arai this was no problem because Mr. Pogo could simply come back after a paid vacation for a few months. Arai would accept this and later in his book write how much he regretted letting Onita have so much pull on the company at this time. To Onita he is doing the company a favor and helping them draw bigger houses. But to many in the roster this would begin them seeing him as someone holding many of them down. In November of 1996, Onita would come back and tell the audience that he had only told one lie in life, and that lie was that he would never wrestle again. The crowd would boo this, and Onita would counter by telling them that he would only come back one time to help Mr. Pogo avenge what had been happening to him, putting the onus of the situation on helping a friend. The match would go down, and it was a success and he instantly found himself back in the main event spot. By the next month, he had set up a deal to have the video distribution company that had abandoned the company during Onita's absence and brought them in to film a December show. The issue was that Toshiba had stepped in to help the company at this time, and they were offended that another company was now there to film and would be distributing the match. This had to be smoothed over by President Arai but this was just the beginning of a rough road ahead. One thing that would ease some tension is that with Onita making his comeback, Hayabusa would request working for All Japan Pro Wrestling. Onita would use his connection to Giant Baba to help him get this wish. It was not enough to make the two best friends, but it did make things slightly less contentious backstage for a while. Onita would work a limited schedule around this time as well because he was still involved with making movies 
and was going to be in the upcoming Rebirth of Mothra 3. Kawasaki Stadium was not going to be able to host the Big May show in 1997. It was announced they would be returning to Kawasaki Stadium in September, leading to Masato Tanaka and Kintaro Kanemura battling to see who would get to face Onita in a big Kawasaki Stadium bout. The bout was offered to Hayabusa, but he declined as it was clear who was to win. Kanemura would get the nod. The match with Kanemura was seen by Onita as the culmination of the Wing feud with FMW from years before. Wing had become a faction within the company and had continuously been an antagonist to Onita in storyline. The show would draw well over 30,000 people to the gate, and it was an overall success. The main event would be Onita against Kanemura, and as would be expected, Onita would defeat Kanemura, but more importantly would be what happened after. Onita being inspired by the Wing team and how passionate they were about Kanemura losing would turn to the FMW roster and shout at them about not having the spirit or unity of the wing team. A press conference was held where Onita, Kanemura, and other wrestlers from the wing group would announce they were leaving FMW. The wing group and funk masters of wrestling had been wrapped up with the company, and Onita was now put into the slot of the top heel. President Arai had been worried about how many fans had turned away, and it would see this as a path to possibly turn things around. Onita hated it. FMW was his promotion that he created, and was not keen on not being portrayed as the hero. Onita was booked in a tag match against Hayabusa the next month, where the two would have a few spirited exchanges where it was clear they hated each other. The match ended with the Zen team winning against Hayabusa's partner, capturing the six-man street fight championships. Onita would debut his Bret Hart flame gear and would begin to portray the heel leader of the Zen group. However, it wasn't all going so great. Onita would take pinfall losses to both Masato Tanaka and Hayabusa in big shows in back-to-back -back months. The bout with Hayabusa would lead to Mr. Ganosuke and Kintaro Kanemura turning on Onita and leaving him laying in a cage. Going into 1998, things were unfortunately only going to get worse. Usually the heel groups were able to run wild in FMW, but the Zen faction was never really given that and would align as a force of good against the new heel faction known as Team No Respect. This made the new dynamic of the company two factions with men trying to be the top heroes and guys that were great antagonists to both factions but were also getting the best of them. Onita was growing less content with how Team No Respect and Kodo Fuyuki were slowly getting more and more of the spotlight. At the same time, a sponsor for the company pulls out. This would be a huge setback and put the promotion's future in jeopardy. However, at the exact same time, DirecTV would begin its expansion and wanted to make FMW one of their exclusives. They would hand the company almost a million dollars a year as well as help out with production. The flip side of the deal was that they would no longer be on television and you could only see it if you happened to have a satellite dish. This deal would be a big contributor to FMW not being able to generate as much money as they were spending. The other mandate was that they wanted the style of wrestling to change. They wanted the style to mirror the style that was popular in the United States with the WWF at the time. Onita had been having his own shows under the Zen brand and you could see his passion dwindling. Things were just no longer a good fit for anyone. No one was happy and no one was doing as well as they felt they could be doing. The first direct TV show would see Onita facing Kodo Fuyuki in a rare singles match, and Kodo Fuyuki would get the victory. This match would not be a pretty one. Onita didn't want to be in the semi-main event of the night, and especially didn't want to be losing a singles match to a man he disliked as much as Fuyuki on such a high-profile show. Loss after loss had taken its toll and Onita would go on a rant after the match where he would rally the crowd in his typical way, but then declare that he was leaving the arena 
having a large portion of the audience leave with him before the main event took place. This would be the same night that Hayabusa finally won the double championship, so it seemed even more calculated. On May 5th, 1998, the Kawasaki show was skipped again, but there would be a Zen show. Onita and his Zen faction would face Team No Respect and lose the championship. At the end of the bout, Atsushi Onita was made to kiss the boot of Team No Respect's manager. Onita was at the breaking point. This was not what he was wanting to be viewed as in wrestling. He saw himself on the level of a Tenru or Riki Choshu at this point, but he was now losing left and right to the younger stars as well as Fuyuki. And on top of that, he was now reduced to kissing the boot of a manager after losing on a day he had made famous for the company. This would be the last Zen show. Onita and Nakagawa would challenge for Team No Respect's Tag Team Championship, but Onita would be turned on by his partner and left laying by Team No Respect once again. He would take time away and make his one in ring appearance for Extreme Championship Wrestling before coming back and forming Team Zero. They were mainly a group to feud with Team No Respect, but it was also during this time Onita came up with the idea of a brand split where he could run shows with all of the FMW talent except Hayabusa so the two wouldn't have to compete for the top spot. This was obviously not ideal for anyone. Onita would have his final match for FMW against Mr. Pogo with a hostile crowd watching. They would put on a match that years before set the crowds on fire, but at this point it just wasn't what it once was. The more important events would take place the next day President Arai would call a talent meeting. He had taken out a life insurance policy because he is having a meeting with Onita to tell him that he wanted to end their working relationship and believed that he may go after him when he let him know that they would no longer be sending wrestlers to his promotion. When he arrived for the meeting, instead of giving the expected reaction, Onita calmly accepts what Arai says and just like that, Onita's involvement with FMW is over. Onita was always known to have such a fiery temper and was expected to react in a much more hostile fashion, but that was not the reaction at all. The amount of resentment between Onita and the promotion had just grown to a level that neither one were really bent out of shape about parting ways with each other. It was more about Onita and the company he founded recognizing that they had outgrown one another. Onita leaving was a blow to the company but was simply for the best with everyone involved. By the beginning of the next year, Onita was in New Japan and would continue his run. He opened Onita Pro and would work with Tenru in the war promotion. He would try to return a few times over the years, but Shochi Arai would turn him down. Onita would have one more big involvement with FMW after leaving, and it came in the wake of the company closing. In the time since leaving the company, Onita had won an election and now had a seat on the Japanese Diet, which is their governing body. After the way the company closed down, Onita would threaten to have Fuyuki held responsible for the financial state of the promotion, but it didn't go anywhere and the two would mend fences before Fuyuki would pass away. He would eventually mend fences with Hayabusa, Tarzan Goto and others over how things were handled all those years ago. Onita always wanted to be a legend, and he was able to build a company from the ground up that was able to compete with established brands of the time. His innovation to pro wrestling cannot be overlooked, and it is thanks to Onita that independent wrestling became the movement that it did. Onita may have never achieved the level of many legends in pro wrestling, but he did something I think is more important with his time in FMW. He established his own level, through his style, he was able to usher in a new age of wrestling that whether it was beloved by the purists or not, sticks in the memories of those who witness it. Onita is often criticized for not leaving FMW in a better position when he left the first time, but to be fair, to him FMW was never meant to be a promotion, it was simply a banner to promote his shows under. There was never a plan for it to continue without him. If he had it to do over now, things may go differently, but many forget. Onita had to watch as what he created was turned into something he had no love for, 
and for every reason that the younger roster and President Arai had to be unhappy with him. He felt he had just as many reasons to be unhappy with what they were doing. Onita's FMW was different from anything else the world had seen, and he created something that is worth celebrating all these years later. With FMW, Onita had created a special thing, an unforgettable thing, a wild thing.